I want to invite you on a journey somewhere between mind and spirit, to a language of colors which sometimes exists beyond the boundaries of words. A language received not by the ears but through the eyes, as we peel back the curtain of ordinary consciousness, we travel down a long forgotten road, shrouded by chaos and our oldest ancestral memories, where logic is undefined and the possibilities are endless. If we are to look at things from a Kabbalistic perspective, just as how the magician uses ritual to bring their will into reality, an artist's processes begin intuitively and at Saluth, before taking form in our emotions and our imagination within Briya and Yetzira, and finally coming into physical manifestation in Asaya. The word callous is a word used frequently in Kenneth Grant's Typhonian trilogies that has multiple meanings representing the essence of colors but also sexual fluids or blood. When we consider Bina or Saturn on the Tree of Life as being the goddess of manifestation, the various colors of the planets beneath her represent different isolated energies that come together in Malkuth. This manifestation on the Earth plane becomes a physical mirror of what occurred in Kether. When viewing a painting from a magical perspective, these various emanations of callus are the medium through which an artist gives their imagination life in the physical world. Because of cultural influence, personal beliefs, and the time period in which it was created, occult artwork is as dynamic and varied as the day is long going back to the earliest cave paintings of Neolithic man. When we traditionally think of the pantheons associated with the Tree of Life, we think of archetypes our mind can easily associate with, such as animals. But there is another kind of magical artwork. Surrealism challenges the viewer's senses by breaching the boundaries of traditional archetypes. Instead of portraying things that are realistic or recognizable, they allow the ambiguity of shape and color to speak to the subconscious mind. One of the founders of French Surrealism in the 1920s, André Breton, wrote in his book, The Surrealist Manifesto, that the purpose of the genre was to resolve the previously contradictory conditions of dream and reality into one absolute reality, a super-reality, or surreality, this is a perfect example of how magicians use ritual aesthetics to induce trance-like states. The derangement of the senses in abstract paintings serves as a way to lift the veil and enter a magical state of consciousness. It's through this understanding that we learn that a painting or a picture can function much in the same way as a sigil. In his book, Cults of the Shadow, Kenneth Grant mentions, It is interesting to note that some of the Surrealists stumbled upon this method of astralization in the 1920s, and earlier, as in the case of Austin Osmond's Bear. The experience is communicable. Many are they who, looking at a painting or listening to a piece of music, have shared the sensations of otherness imparted to the work by the artists who created it. Unusual juxtapositions of color, a mysterious massing of shades, strange perspectives such as Kiriko and Delvaux have the power to plunge the mind into aeonic and nightmare abysses. The weird specters of Max Ernst, Dahlinian pavements haunted by elongated shadows of dust. Hello, my name is Sam Shadow. 
and welcome to my art studio. Today I thought I would talk about a few of my recent paintings and some of the occult themes that run. This painting is called King of the Moon. I guess this would be a good one to start off with because it sort of illustrates how I have multiple different influences that uh, are very subtle but somehow come together to form a much bigger picture. Um, I think inspiration can really come from anywhere. It doesn't even have to be explicitly a cult uh, or even from your own imagination. Sometimes I can see something on television or I hear a word or a phrase or read a paragraph in a book or just have a, a casual thought come to me while I take a stroll outside and um, I think it's an accumulation of all these different little things that add up to make a great piece of art or to uh, make a unique artist that isn't a direct copy of something else. Since I was very young I've always found the colors orange and green complement each other very well. The inspirations for this painting come from many directions but the piece itself stands alone for many of these. In the recently released book, Meon 3, by Addie Newton, David Beth writes a foreword about Quran Zahn under the name Baron Lundy. In regards to esoteric Vudan, Baron Lundy is a moon god who is associated with the nightside mysteries of the transcendental id, or the primordial magical consciousness, a divide between the rational daytime objective consciousness and our darker, primal, more abstract waters of the mind. This painting was not done specifically of Baron Lundy, but I find his function to be emblematic of André Breton's perspective of unifying the contradictory conditions of dream and reality. I'm very inspired by sculpture, and I'll sometimes use different works as a basis for my paintings. There is a video game called Hylix, which is created with claymation sprites, the main antagonist of the game is named Gibby, King of the Moon. He has a round orange head, not unlike the central figure in this painting. The name King of the Moon is interesting to me, because lunar energies are often associated with female deities. So to have a male moon deity creates a new dynamic. The figure on the left was also inspired by a casual enemy in Hylix, and his head makes me think of a cactus. The figure on the right is my own variation of Max Ernst's donut-headed entities that we see often in his paintings. The purple planet above them was done with half of an eaten grapefruit peel. This painting is called The Witch's Sabbath. It helps to understand The Witch's Sabbath not as any sort of historical occurrence, but as an event that takes place on the astral plane. While originally starting as propaganda used to persecute cunning folk and wise women during the era of witch trials, the infamy of the witch's Sabbath has exceeded its reputation. Instead of being a byproduct of prejudice, it has been recontextualized by modern practitioners as a ritual experience. If we look at it as an event taking place in the realm of dreams, ritual, trance, or meditation, where witches celebrate and make contact with the devil, then this experience is no different than the alternate dimensions of consciousness described as Universe B. I chose a black background to create the illusion of lighting only from the bonfire. I included a jack-o'-lantern face within the fire as a small reference to the origins of Samhain in Ireland. I used a myriad of greens and yellows whilst creating the two figures on the right, they have no defined appearance, as it is my wish for the viewer to interpret them for themselves. The large horn figure could be seen as the devil himself, while the other figure could be a fellow witch traveling the astral plane, or perhaps a type of familiar spirit. This painting is called Visitors. When I think of aliens, I typically don't think of little green men and flying saucers. However, I see them as a new archetype in spirituality that has grown exponentially over the last hundred years. 
starting with Aleister Crowley's picture of Lamb and expanding from there. When I use the word alien, I am speaking about something that exists outside of conventional archetypes. Many of the creatures described in H.P. Lovecraft's stories like Azathoth or Yogg-Sothoth are an approximation of something that cannot be fully described with the limitations of words. This is a glow-in-the-dark painting. I chose purple for the background to represent the mauve zone, or universe B. Once again, my inspiration from sculptures comes through. The two dark totemic figures on each side of the painting are based off of carvings by Clark Ashton Smith, the one on the left being Moon Dweller and the one on the right being Azathoth. This painting is called Mercury and Friends. This is my favorite painting I've ever done, and it was also the first in the recent series I started in January. Some of the figures in this painting should be recognizable to you, such as Thoth in his ibis form on the left. The figure in the center is an anthropomorphized version of the planetary symbol for Mercury, the third figure being another familiar spirit emanating from the realms of shape and color. Max Ernst is one of my biggest influences, and many of my donut-headed figures were directly inspired by his style. This has become a theme that I've adopted in my work and tried to diversify in my own way. I also did some experimenting with textures. The subtle flecks of green throughout the sky were done using plastic Brillo pads. Similar to King of the Moon, the sun in this picture was created by using a half-eaten grapefruit. As you can see, I've started on a new one, and I have a lot of different colors going on here. Um, so one of the techniques that I've been using recently um, which was also influenced by Max Ernst, to my understanding, is I will take about five or six different colors and I will put drops of paint all over a canvas and then I'll take saran wrap and crumple it into a ball and I will dab it all over the canvas, blending and creating textures. And sometimes I'll even take long uh, pieces of saran wrap and stretch them over the canvas and press them down to create these really interesting textures and layers that you see here. And um, as you can see in this one, I have a lot of warm colors like reds, yellows, oranges, uh, colors like that. So whenever I do decide to paint this, I'll probably use a cool color to balance it out, like a purple or a blue or something akin to that, maybe a green. And when I, what I usually do is I will paint out shapes and uh, trace out shapes with a paintbrush with one very solid um, sort of opaque color to um, create a contrast. And that's how I get the effect that you see in a lot of my paintings where I have all these different colors inside of a shape. Um, what I'll do is I'll first, I'll prep the canvas like you saw um, before, and then I'll just go through and paint everything to fill it in. Um, I like different textures. I like relying on color and shape rather than being more explicit of um, or more realistic with uh, the picture I'm trying to show. Demons to some, angels to others. I believe that when we experience our higher selves, our holy guardian angel, our daimon, we are experiencing shades of our highest potential. We begin to understand what we are truly capable of and use that inner strength as direction regardless of how one chooses to characterize it. It is when we follow those ambitions without being distracted by our egos or outside influences that we are pursuing our true will. The magical path is not an easy one. Hell, you can take magic out of the equation. Life itself is not easy. 
And like all things in spirituality, we characterize these struggles as well. When you learn what you are truly capable of, there will always be others who try to damage your self-esteem or minimize your efforts. Or you may find yourself in the throes of health problems, financial problems, or relationship problems. While we all seek to follow our true wills, it's important to remember that we live a very human existence. And in these moments, diamonds form under pressure, and we see our true character. Just as the snake sheds its skin, we must learn to transverse these boundaries and move forward. In a world full of chaos, the possibilities are endless, and despite all your adversity and imperfections, you will soon realize that you can do anything.